Good evening, and thank you for participating in our panel discussion on the Klamath Basin, organized in collaboration with Oregon Humanities as part of their Consider This series, for which you'll find information on upcoming events at OregonHumanities.org and with co-sponsorship via the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, or KRRC. There will be lots of acronyms this evening, as you'll soon hear. I'm Jim Proctor, a professor in the Environmental Studies Program at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon, also a co-sponsor of the event. Before introducing our distinguished panel, I'd like to acknowledge a team of Lewis and Clark students, Alana Converse, Alex Rodowski, Annalisa Regelbrugge, Annabel Rousseau, Clara Dyke, Janie Overland, and Kat Altoffer, who are part of a course this semester in environmental engagement and have done both background research on the Klamath Basin and a lot of planning with Oregon Humanities for this event. Thank you, students. Our shorthand definition of environmental engagement in their course is, quote, conversation toward action. Many of the important environmental issues today are a challenge because they demand action, yet rarely exhibit consensus among us on what should be done. What our students often learn is that engagement-based conversation is conversation across difference and involves as much, maybe more, listening as it does speaking. This is what stakeholders in the Klamath Basin have been doing for a long time, as they have struggled, sometimes successfully, toward collective action, addressing their land, water, lives, and livelihoods. These conversations have recently come together toward action in the form of dam removal, with four structures on the upper Klamath River now slated for decommissioning in the next few years the largest dam removal action so far in the United States. The structure of this panel will move from the past to the future. How we got to this point of dam removal, given the long history of settlement, land and water use and conflict in the Klamath Basin, then what may happen in future following dam removal and what sorts of conversations might still be needed toward what sorts of actions. Following this roughly one hour panel, we welcome all of those listening right now to participate in breakout room discussions facilitated by our students. If you have pre-registered, you have received a link for those breakout conversations and you will receive a reminder toward that link at the end of this panel. I'd urge you to please jot down questions and ideas as you listen to these panelists for sharing during this discussion session that follows. We know in environmental studies that there is rarely such a thing as a once and for all solution. Let us listen to the context and wisdom our distinguished panelists offer as they reflect on what came before and what might come after dam removal in the Klamath Basin. And perhaps we will each carry with us lessons toward our collective futures in our own places and on this planet we share. I'd now like to briefly introduce our panelists. We are deeply grateful that three of the main Native American tribes of the Klamath Basin are represented here tonight. As one proceeds from the mouth of the Klamath River in Northern California upstream to near the basin headwaters in South Central Oregon, these include the Yurok, the Karuk, and finally the Klamath. My initial meeting was with Chairman Don Gentry, of the Klamath tribes and his tribal council and water board. Chairman Gentry has served for three terms as elected chairman of the Klamath tribal council with the philosophy of service leader and with main themes including water and land management, housing, children, and education. Chairman Gentry, welcome and thank you so much for agreeing to participate in the panel and for helping us bring other tribal leaders onto the panel as well. Thank you. So did you want me to introduce myself a little bit further? 
I will continue with the introductions. If that's okay, Chairman Gentry, thank you. Heading downstream, I am grateful to Chairman Russell Atterbury of the Karuk. Chairman Atterbury was born and raised along the Klamath River and has been actively involved in education throughout his career. Chairman Atterbury has advocated for the tribe and river throughout the dam decommission and river restoration process and is passionate about restoring clean water and spawning grounds to the basin so Karuk children can grow up fishing and providing for their communities along a healthy Klamath River. Chairman Atterbury, welcome as well. Honor and a pleasure. Thank you. As this great Klamath River moves toward the Pacific Ocean, I welcome and thank Chairman Joe James of the Yurok tribe. Chairman James has worked for tribal governments for the last 22 years in the areas of fisheries, water policy and law, infrastructure, protection of cultural resources, economic development and leadership. He has expanded their economic development portfolio, protected the Yurok tribe's natural and cultural resources, furthered the importance of educational achievement for tribal youth and instituted elders programs and services. Chairman James, welcome and thank you. Thank, thank you, Jim, for the introduction. It's an honor to be here. I am also grateful to Becky Hyde, a Klamath Basin rancher and since 2019, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Commissioner. As a rancher, Becky works in Klamath and Lake Counties and has served on a variety of commissions focused on water management in the basin. She brings experience in conversation and action across difference on a range of environmental issues. And I must say everyone with whom I discuss this panel knows Becky. So I'm so glad you're on this panel, Becky, welcome. Finally, I welcome Mark Bransom, CEO of the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, the entity charged with facilitating dam removal and restoration of the Klamath River. Mark brings two decades of experience in water planning, engineering, and construction in the Western United States. And he too has worked with a diverse range of stakeholders facilitating discussion around water management issues. Mark will help us understand the details of the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement, the KHSA, which led to the formation of KRRC and the impending dam removal. Mark, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to each of our panelists. You will each get a chance to now speak on the history, the deep history of this basin in just a moment. So this is where we will start with history before our current time, how this dam removal came to be, what lives and livelihoods have been a part of the Klamath Basin, whether from way back or in more recent times. Chairman Gentry, Atterbury and James, can you please start by telling us the story of this place, the Klamath Basin, and the stories of your people in this place? Chairman Gentry, if you could start first and then followed by Chairman Atterbury and James. Thank you. Yeah, um, our traditions, our stories, we, our creation story has created a place, he placed us here you know, with plans and purposes. And everything he placed here was for our benefit in uh, the good and responsibility. We are part of all that. So we are the Klamath, Yusukmi, uh, uh, and Modokmi, the Modok, and the Numu, the Yuhuskin band of Snake River Indians. So we're actual three people groups that were signed into the Treaty of 1864. Our uh, leaders from those different tribes uh, signed into the treaty. So we, uh, we lived on the land, all the resources that were here, and uh, uh, we weren't so much uh, uh, into agriculture. We did uh, use fire to stimulate berries and, and plants and so forth, but all the resources that we needed to survive here were here, you know, with the lakes, the rivers, the marshes, and, uh, um, you know, uh, fish, waterfowl, um, game, plants, berries, all those things have been important to our people. 
And uh, of course, uh, the cheat-alls, the salmon, were a part of uh, what was once here, unfortunately, that had been denied to us uh, for over 100 years when the first dam uh, went in on the Klamath and blocked the salmon and steelhead from coming up. And uh, so, um, you know, just to relate it to the salmon, but uh, we have a responsibility, a moral and a spiritual responsibility to make sure that what happens is uh, uh, good for all the resources that are here. And we as people are, of course, a part of that. And we have a significant responsibility to oversee those things. So that's uh, taught in our history and culture, you know, taught in our legends and stories, uh, what's important. And I've had the privilege of when I take, uh, uh, have taken some of the Chuam and Koptu and still take uh, trout to our elders, have opportunity to listen to them about what's important. And also the chi owls, the salmons that we no longer have are a part of what should have been here when we reserved our treaty in 1864. Uh, we ceded nearly 20 million acres of land to the federal government for the benefit of US citizens and reserved a homeland to be ours forever. And all the resources that uh, were there, what we intended to use and I thought would be there forever is how we'd sustain ourselves and live uh, in the way we, we've, um, we've created intended. So that's just a, just a real brief summary uh, of uh, our standing and our connection to the land. Chairman Gentry, thank you so much. If we could proceed please with Chairman Atterbury. Hi, Iki. Hello, and um, thank you very much, Professor Proctor, for organizing this uh, get together. And and um, and we hope that uh, your students um, are able to take some um, positive feedback uh, from this and and uh, see a different point of view. Um, as as you mentioned already, I I was born and raised in Happy Camp. Um, fourth generation. Um, my mom and dad were both raised here in Happy Camp, as well as their parents. And um, so the, um, the Klamath River has been for, since time memorial, the lifeblood for the, the Kuruk tribe, um, all the tribes that, that uh, live along the Klamath River. And um, it was a uh, healthy and happy culture, a healthy and happy way of life. Uh, many people don't realize um, that uh, the fish provided much more than a food substance. It provided uh, uh, a healthy way of life in, in uh, the process that goes on uh, as a young person growing up here in Happy Camp. Um, my dad fished and took uh, me and my brother out fishing um, uh, different times of the year. Um, you know, wintertime, it might have been fishing in the river. Um, spring and fall, it may have been fishing in the creeks, um, uh, hiking into the mountains to fish in the lakes. And, and it was always done with a purpose, a purpose of bringing uh, some, um, a healthy food source home to put on the dinner table. And the process that goes along that with that is part of it. So while um, fishing for a living might sound like a lot of fun, it's also a lot of work. The process of going into, um, you, you sure you catch the fish or, uh, and you, but there's a, a process of, of cleaning, um, uh, preserving. Um, we made it a point to give uh, fish out to our family members, our elders. So that part of the work that, that uh, needed to be done, uh, that was done by our children, was very important to the lifestyle here. So it goes way beyond um, uh, just thinking of it as fishing. It was a process that was um, uh, really um, substantial in, in the part of growing up here. Um, the consultation process, uh, the Obama administration changed the 
um, language in the, in the um, with an executive order um, that said that when there's projects going on in Indian country, the language was changed from should consult with the tribes in the area to must consult with the tribes in the area. So, um, you know, that process was done uh, quite a few years ago and we're, we're just now uh, rolling around to understanding what meaningful consultation means. And I say that because that was the um, initial failure um, when those dams were put in. Um, I, um, we, we understand that there was no ill intentions, that they were put in for probably different reasons. The problem was they didn't consult with the people who lived there. And nobody knows Indian country like the people who live there. Um, that's just a fact. So to not consult with them um, was, was a mistake. Um, the lower dam, Iron Gate Dam, was put in without any sort of fish passage. Had there been some cons consultation done, uh, the, the local people would, would have said, you, we have to have a way for these fish to return home, to return where they spawned, to uh, not cut off 350 miles of spawning grounds. Um, had those consultations take place, taken place, we might not even have, be having this conversation today, but they did and, and we are. So um, it's, uh, there's four um, current tensions that surround the water management decisions. And we want to make sure we provide water levels in the upper Klamath Lake for suckers, release of water from Upper Klamath Lake for coho and other salmonoids in the Klamath River, irrigation deliveries to the project farmers, diversion to the wildlife uh, refugees for migratory waterfowl. And um, so we, we need to work together um, to see if we can accomplish these goals. Um, uh, whether we can or we can't, we have to work together to see if to see if we can achieve all those goals. In um, 2010, the Kuruk, Klamath, Yurok all joined federal federal agencies and uh, a host of local governments and proposed a solution to the crisis. During those meetings. Um, we all express the interest that um, we, we don't want to do away with, with farming. It's, it's, also, it's a um, viable commodity, but we also don't want to do away with the fisheries, the fish uh, population. And what has diminished over the years is the, is the fish population. So um, whether or not we can um, reach an agreement that, that uh, provides enough water for everybody remains to be seen. That's a goal we need to work towards. And uh, once we work towards that goal and see where we're at, we throw in um, uh, water conservation efforts, uh, introduce things like um, uh, maybe reservoirs that uh, that could be built that would provide water for the irrigation so there's not diversion from our our tributaries because uh, dam removal is only a piece of the solution. And um, so we want to introduce those ideas on some of our tributaries into the Klamath. Some of them were known as um, uh, beaver valleys. There's no more beaver. They used to build these um, uh, beaver dams uh, that were not on the main stem of the rivers or tributaries, but off to the side, and they provided uh, water for summertime. Um, 
upslope projects, which we call um, um, prescribed burnings or uh, the tribes used to burn off around uh, the villages. It provided a multitude of purposes. Uh, and one was to provide, to get rid of the brush that uh, that held up the snowpack and, and there would be a better snowpack and there would be a, a longer um, uh, water storage through the summertime. Um, so there's many different ideas uh, on the Shasta River. There's, um, it's lava rock terrain. And when we divert water from the Shasta River, 50% of it leaks into because of the terrain. Lining those canals would put more water back into the river. So th I believe there's a, a working together is the only way. And um, we need to move forward and see if we can accomplish those goals through uh, conservation efforts, through dam removal efforts, through uh, the reduced fields that, that keep our snowpack from um, uh, reaching the ground uh, so they don't melt off so fast. Um, so, so in closing, I, I would just like to say we, um, we have some good ideas. We are working together and we need to continue to do that. Um, but most importantly, you need to consult with the people who live in the area that has been a long time coming. It is happening now and let's keep it going. Yoatua, thank you. Chairman Atterbury, thank you so much. Chairman James. Aikui, Nick now. Uh, Joseph James, Iraq Tribal Chairman. I, I come from the village of Shregon, located on the lower Klamath River. Just a little bit about the Yurok tribe. Uh, Yurok tribe is a is a is a natural resource tribe uh, that relies heavily on the uh, uh, the Klamath River in its basin. We rely on the on the Pacific Ocean for all the uh, for all the the materials there regarding uh, mussels, Pacific lamprey, uh, our seaweed. Uh, going into the river, we rely on our sturgeon, our steelhead, our, our, our salmon. Um, we're, we're stewards of the land, and uh, uh, salmon has always been our diet. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, taught by my parents, uh, my grandparents, uh, we, we utilize uh, uh, our traditional redwood dugout canoes. We're, we're traditional people. We're basket makers. We're uh, canoe builders. Um, and again, as a, uh, everything that to do with our way of life is tied to the Klamath River as it, as it provides us food, uh, but it also provides us our basket material that we gather along the, along the river banks for our roots, for our basket people to make their baskets. Um, so it's, 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 our, it's, our, it's our who we are as Indian people, traditional people, indigenous people, as first peoples. Um, again, as a, we're, we as a indigenous people are not going nowhere. Um, we have a long history. And today we're talking about how important uh, the Klamath River and the basin is, is to us, all, all from, the, from the Pacific Ocean all the way up to the top. Uh, and you'll hear many stories and histories, but uh, I, 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 we've worked hard and we're going to continue to work hard. Today we're going to talk about dam removal. Um, at one point, uh, you know, 15 plus years ago, we were talking about one dam and, and now we're, we're moving four dams here in a couple of years. Uh, the biggest project in the, in the history of the United States as Chairman Atterbury, that's uh, the next action after dam removal is restoration, uh, improving uh, the wetlands, riparian. Um, uh, that's the next, that's the next, uh, struggle that we're all going to face and there's plenty of work to go there and we're going to be looking for partners and, and uh because that's going to be a, a lifelong um endeavor that we owe to the climate basin is the restoration effort and uh we're already thinking about that already um uh, knowing that that's going to take at minimum 
uh, you know, 30 to 40 years at a minimum, knowing that what we got to do is, is heal, heal Mother Earth. And uh, everybody's got to do their part. And uh, myself as a tribal chairman, I look forward to that. And, uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for today. Chairman James, thank you so much. We appreciate you for being here. I'd now like to please bring Becky into the conversation. Becky, if you can recount for us briefly the settlement of the area for irrigated agriculture and ranching, please, and give us your history. Okay, um, thank you, um, Professor Proctor. And uh, when I, I mentioned that I was a little bit anxious about um, this panel earlier, and I've been doing the whole uh, wake up at four in the morning and uh, ruminate and, and think of, of all, all of the uh, different things that I wish, wish, wish we could, could communicate. But I think the first thing that I need to uh, communicate is um, that I am not a co-equal on this panel with these uh, tribal chairmen. A co-equal to them would be um, President Biden, a president of a nation. These are um, sovereign leaders in our basin. And it's, it's an honor to be on a panel with them. But I just want to make it clear uh, that that's the way I think those of us in agriculture who have engaged in serious discussions in the past with tribes have really come to understand um, uh, the relationship. So I, I need to say that I am, I am honored to be on this panel with them, um, but they bring thousands and thousands of years of collective history uh, to this conversation. And um, so I just need to say that. Um, briefly, I will say that my family, uh, on my side of the family came to Oregon um, in the 1840s and has been in agriculture ever since, not in the Klamath Basin, but my husband's family has ranched um, on uh, the Upper Williamson, which is one of the tributaries to Klamath Lake for 110 years. So the family has um, been around for a long time, uh, but a short amount of time uh, in relation to uh, the native history in the region. Um, let's see, I have my little notes up on the wall. So if I look away, um, um, I, I wanted, I, I want to say that uh, people began uh, settling in the buying up uh, Indian allotments, which is part of our conflict, I think, that begins in the basin, um, like with, with my family uh, a long, long time ago. And then in 1905, the Klamath Reclamation Project below Klamath Lake was created and that Klamath Reclamation Project is full of, of many, many farm families. Uh, today, a lot of them um, were part of something called a pickle jar lottery to begin farming. Um, they are, uh, um, there's just a lot of dear families that I, that I love uh, and, um, and we, we, have a, we have a lot going on and we have a lot going on in this particular year type, uh, given that we have maybe the worst drought ever back to back drought and everything is pretty stressed. So um, what else do I wanna say really quickly? Um, I don't represent all of agriculture. That's really important to say. There are farmers, there are ranchers. In the Klamath Project alone, there are 15 different irrigation districts. And when we've done settlements in the past, we've had to have each and every one of those irrigation districts on board. And uh, that's, that's hard. And uh, I am, just wanna say that I'm really thankful that your students are studying the Klamath Basin. And I also want to say that I have one of the favorite, my, my favorite Lewis and Clark students, which is my son, Jack Hyde, who is at Lewis and Clark right now as a junior and uh, is an econ major. But <laughs> that's all I'll say for now.
Becky, thank you so much. Thank you for reminding us whom we are alongside here. Again, our deep appreciation to the tribal chairs. And thank you, Becky, for your honesty. I think our students know that speaking honestly is hard. And we appreciate you for modeling that for our students, including your son. I wanna give everybody a chance to reflect on what they're hearing. But first, if I could briefly just ask Mark, if you could briefly join the conversation. Mark, maybe you can help us understand the recent history of water negotiations, which seems full of acronyms as we've learned. Please demystify and help us understand how your KRRC came to be. Yeah, thank you, Professor Proctor. And thank you to Oregon Humanities for the invitation to participate. Uh, as Becky says, it's a real honor to join the tribal chairs uh, to participate in this conversation and I very much appreciate that and, and this opportunity. And greetings to all of the folks uh, at home who are joining us uh, this evening. Uh, really appreciate folks taking an interest in this. So let me just mention first off uh, to orient us that we've been referring to the dam removal project and we're talking about four dams on the main stem Klamath River, starting uh, at the upstream end uh, with the JC Boyle Dam in Oregon, moving down river into uh, California, the Copco number one and the Copco number two dams. And then finally the most down river of the four, the Iron Gate Dam which also includes a, uh, a fish hatchery that was built as mitigation for the uh, blockage of uh, the Klamath River, uh, as Chairman, Gent uh, Chairman Atterbury said, no, no fish passage uh, facilities there. Those four dams are uh, part of what is known as the Lower Klamath Pro Hydroelectric Project, uh, governed under the jurisdiction from the, by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Those four dams are currently owned and operated by Pacific Corp uh, and a subsidiary Pacific Power. At the same time that the uh, utility Pacific Corp was considering whether to petition the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission FERC to renew the 50 year operating license for the hydroelectric project, they undertook um, and engaged in discussions with uh, tribal entities, with the farming and ranching community, with conservation groups, with the fishing, uh, commercial and sport fishing uh, organizations and, and, and stakeholders about the potential to turn the dams over to another entity for purposes of surrendering the hydroelectric license back to FERC uh, and decommissioning the project, at least those four uh, dams that are part of the, part of the uh, hydroelectric project. As it was mentioned by one of the tribal chairmen, those conversations go back at least to 2010. Uh, and the KRRC, the Renewal Corporation, was born out of the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement as amended and signed and executed in 2016. So the KRRC is a nonprofit corporation that exists specifically and solely for the purposes of uh, uh, obtaining all of the permits and all of the necessary authorizations, including taking ownership of the four dams and then surrendering that operating license for the facilities back to FERC uh, and getting FERC's approval for a decommissioning plan to remove the four dams and then restore the lands that make up that project area. So about 8,000 acres of lands currently inundated under the reservoir footprints and the dams and surrounding uh, lands uh, will be uh, restored uh, once the uh, facilities are removed. So again, uh, the KRC exists solely to accomplish that particular mission. And it's really important to me uh, to mention that the KRC is really standing on the shoulders and building on all of the great work uh, that, the, that the tribes and others uh, have been doing over the last several decades to get us to the point where we are today, where we are literally right on the cusp uh, of being able to uh, begin removal of these facilities, which on our current schedule, we hope to do uh, with some enabling construction projects in the second half of 2022 
and initiate the drawdown of the reservoirs and the physical removal of the facilities and the restorations of the land in 2023 and continuing on into at least the early part of 2024. And then the compliance with all the permit terms and conditions to ensure that the restoration takes hold appropriately will extend beyond that for some uh, period yet to be defined by the regulators, but likely out into 2028 or beyond. And then the KRRC will effectively uh, turn out the lights, close the door, uh, disband and, uh, and go away. So that's kind of the, the story of the Renewal Corporation and what it is that we are about. Mark, thank you so much. We have some time here, panelists. Before we move on, I'm curious, what did you hear in each other's stories? Does anyone wish to comment or ask a question of another panelist on what you heard? So this is uh, it's Chairman Atterbury. I'll, I'll um, <clears throat> just a uh, um, couple of things maybe that um, um, didn't get mentioned was um, and the reason that we want to uh, remove the dams is um, the water quality and the water flows. Um, so I want to just point it out to the students that these are these are very important factors and we can go back to 2001 um, when there was the fish kill and 60,000 salmon washed up on the shore of the Klamath River and, and died. And it was due to poor water quality and low water flows. When, when you get lo low water flows, the water quality becomes um, um, heated, uh, it, it's, it becomes too warm, which causes a, a, a disease for the fish. So uh, there's, those are a, a couple of important facts that, uh, that I wanna make sure uh, that, that was mentioned. Um, and when we talk about water quality, um, as you move down to the last dam, the, the buildup of the blue-green algae became so severe that you know you could scoop it out with a cup, as, as uh, was shown many times. But um, the um, the state, the state of California, um, uh, uh, after we urged the state, uh, the Kuruk tribe, the Yurok tribe, Klamath tribes, um, to to put up signs because uh, below Iron Gate Dam. Um, was that the water quality was so poor that it was unsafe to swim in, it was unsafe for uh, to drink, it was unsafe for to let your dog drink there, uh, animals, any kind of animals. Um, and, and so that, that's, that sort of uh, build up there is, uh, and I just thought that I would mention those two things, water quality and water flows play, play, play a big part in here. Thank you, Chairman Atterbury. Um, I do see Becky with her hand up and I believe though Chairman Gentry was going to say something. Is it okay if we have Chairman Gentry first, Becky? Chairman Gentry, go ahead. Yeah, what, you know, it's really difficult to really characterize everything that affects, uh, you know, the, uh, all the resources here in the basin. And what I didn't hear, we didn't have opportunity to really coordinate together on how to frame this. So we spoke uh, pretty specifically and pretty on a limited basis, but. Uh, and it's related to the water quality. It's related to all these problems or why we need to have the dams removed. But uh, there have been significant changes, you know, in the basin. Uh, you know, everything from the way that the forest has been managed with the exclusion of fire. Uh, agricultural practices, uh, you know, it's changed significantly. A lot more irrigated agriculture. The Klamath Project, certainly very significant where you diked and drained uh, significant wetlands, the Everglades of the West, and now we're irrigating that with our natural Klamath Lake and uh, you know, created the Klamath Project, which uh, manages, basically it's a glorified reservoir almost now as it's managed where our, our Tuam and Koptur are endangered. 
but uh, just to frame the complexity of the problems, the significant changes, and I, I just saying there's unintended consequences that we're all dealing with here today. And you, you couple that with the changes in climate and, the, and the dry water years, all those affect uh, all the resources that are important to all of us. Uh, there's been a lot of development of irrigated agriculture. You know, there's a limited water supply that's even becoming more and more limited. So we're dealing with a complexity of issues uh, that affect all of us in the basin, you know, and sustainability is key. And I, I would submit that we've kind of went a, over that uh, threshold there. Uh, so a dam removal is a part, but to restore the salmon and steelhead and bring them back, we need to address the comprehensive watershed uh, problems and the impacts. Um, you know, that, and, uh, and I would submit to reduce uh, uh, the amount of uh, irrigated agriculture, you know, to, to be, uh, um, to provide what's necessary for the species. So, uh, I just wanted to, I, I didn't hear that collective story. I just felt it was important to frame that. And uh, we're all in this together. We're all a part of the basin. And uh, to, for our students and everybody listening in to understand the complexity of the issues and Maybe we can focus on the uh, discussion in the future on what we, what we can do to address that. But I just feel like that was kind of missing a little bit. Chairman Gentry, thank you. Thank you very much. Becky. All right, thank you. I so appreciate uh, Chairman Gentry uh, bringing that up. And I think it's it's really critical and and uh, was missing from, from the conversation. Um, I want to take up your challenge for what have I heard. Um, and one of the things that I think I heard um, from Chairman Atterbury is that uh, we need to figure out water allocation um, for suckers, the important need for suckers in that are endangered in Klamath Lake. Uh, we need releases for coho so that um, coho have the water that they need. Uh, we need to find a way to get some water for irrigation for uh, family farms. Um, and we need to find a way to get water to uh, a very important water to our migratory waterfowl in the lower, uh, lower project. And then uh, I also want to go on to say that I heard from Chairman Gentry um, that in the Klamath Basin, we diked and drained a lot of wetlands to create agriculture, and that is true. Um, I think it's over 300,000 acres uh, were diked and drained, and that changed a lot in the basin in ways that are really difficult to recover from without substantial uh, restoration. I also heard that we are using Klamath Lake as a glorified reservoir. And um, I heard um, uh, Chairman Gentry say that we need to downsize irrigated agriculture and um, that there's, I mean, I heard other things too, that there's other things at play like climate change. But I'd like to say that there was a piece in the Klamath Hydro Settlement Agreement that has not been addressed in the basin. And I'm just gonna read this. This is um, section 1.9 of the KHSA, the Klamath Hydro Set Settlement Agreement. And this kind of deals with the other parts of the agreement. And it says the parties, so that would be tribes, ag and the NGOs that were involved in the KHSA agreement because agriculture was uh, also very supportive of dam removal as part of a indivisible package that addressed all the other issues around ag. So the parties are committed to engage in good faith efforts to develop, to develop and enter into a subsequent agreement or agreements pertaining to other water, fisheries, land, agriculture, refuge, and economic sustainability issues in the Klamath Basin with the goal to complete such an agreement within the next year. And that was in 2016. And right now we're in 2021 and uh, we haven't done that. We did have an agreement called the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement that failed in Congress. Um, and dam removal is a beautiful, incredible thing. And I am certainly hoping that I will get to see um, uh, salmon and steelhead back up in the tributaries. But 
uh, we have so much work to do and we have been wasting time. So there, thank you. <laughs> Becky, thank you. Chairman James. So thank you, Becky, for that closing there, wasting time. Um, yeah, uh, the Klamath Basin is uh, extremely complicated. You know, um, the river is hurting, our, our fish are hurting. Uh, as I mentioned, we're not going nowhere. Um, action, you know, that's, that's what's needed. Plan of action, uh, uh, because the, uh, the basin needs it. Um, that's, that's what I signed up for, to, to do my job. Uh, in, in knowing that this, this whole basin and this river system is, is extremely complicated. Uh, being able to uh, work with our, our partners, uh, 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 my fellow brothers and sisters of tribes, uh, you know, I think what you heard, uh, what I've heard, uh, <clears throat> it, 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 it's our livelihood. It's, it's our identity of who we are. Uh, it, culturally, spiritually, traditionally, um, right now in our, in our government practices, um, the need to improve the basin uh, for our, for ourselves, for our, our generations, on the backs of what our elders have done and laid the groundwork for us. Um, so, and again, as I I look forward uh, to the continuing dialogue, but but the much needed action. That, that is needed um, because uh, I've talked many times uh, with partners and stuff like that as uh, I, I look forward to, uh, now it's 2021. Um, and again, as a, uh, we don't have time. Uh, this year is gonna be bad for us, we know that. Uh, but at the same time, we always gotta keep in mind the long, the end game, the long game of how can we improve the, the basin? Uh, and that has followed through a, a series of action steps. But yeah, thank you for that, Jim. Chairman James, thank you very much. Panelists, if okay, I'd like to now turn to a very brief look into the future with each of you. Could we do that, please? We only have a few minutes to close out this panel. And again, thank you so much for your participation. and. Participants online, if you're like me, you just want to process all this in conversation with others because it's so rich and there is so much conversation to continue. And as Chairman James, Becky and others have said, there's so much action needed as well. But let's think briefly about the future. If I could start with Mark, give us a sense as clearly as you can, let's say following, what was it, 2028? and the dissolution of the KRRC, what might happen next as far as you could envision? Yeah, thank you, Jim. You know, I view dam removal as a project that is creates resiliency in, in this natural system that we, we refer to as the, the Klamath River watershed, the Klamath River Basin. And furthermore, and I think you've heard this from the other panelists as well, dam removal is a, a necessary, but it is not a sufficient measure uh, to really comprehensively address the many resource challenges that we face in the Klamath. And so there remains much, much more work to be done. So our hope is that by removing the dams and Jump starting through the little bit of catalyze, catalyzing that we will do on restoration. We will lay a foundation for future efforts to continue the, the, the work that needs to be done to restore the main stem, the tributaries, uh, address the four major issues that uh, Chairman Gentry brought, brought up earlier, uh, and really set the, you know, set the stage for the good work that needs to follow. So we're, we're optimistic that we're taking an important first step, building on the good work of others and to be followed by further good works uh, to really uh, lay out the vision and, and do the hard work on the ground that needs to be done for the future of the basin. 
Mark, thank you. And thank you for what you and KRRC are facilitating. Thank Becky, you. if we could move to you, Becky. Again, I appreciate your honesty. And I'm wondering how might you envision those needed conversations take place okay, in the future? I'll, I'll try to be very quick because I know we don't have much time here. And I actually uh, wrote down a bunch of, of, of thoughts on this. I'm shifting to look at my thoughts. Um, first of all, one of the things we have not talked about is trauma in the basin and uh, especially historic trauma for around native people, around serious issues like genocide and also the issues around uh, especially termination of uh, the Klamath tribes in the 1950s. So there is a lot of history in the basin that is extremely heavy. And it is something that we need to figure out how to reckon with as communities. It's a big, big deal. And I just wanna mention that um, to a very different degree, there is now also trauma in the ag community. And that um, has to do with uh, interruptions in agricultural deliveries and all the uncertainty. So when we come to rooms together, we are bringing a lot of trauma with us when we come into a room and a lot of feelings. And how we cope with that is something I think about a lot, um, but is necessary. The next thing I wanted to say is that um, we need to address these problems at the scale of the problem. So I think within native communities, there's this, this talking a lot about decolonizing, decolonizing uh, what we, we have done. And so in a way, dam removal is like a decolonizing effort, but we haven't done the other piece of it. So uh, I think you might have be following your, your students, or I certainly hope they are following uh, Representative Sim Simpson, who has recently talked about removing the dams, four dams on the Snake River at a cost. Uh, he has put out what would it cost to really make that transition as a community to do that. The price tag, $33.5 billion. So one of the things, reasons we're failing in the Klamath Basin is because dam removal is a nice idea, but if you're really talking about transitioning and having you know, a, a ag community that is solid but smaller, those issues are all, uh, it's, it, we need to begin addressing the problem at its scale. Um, and that's, that's, we're not doing that yet. And we must, uh, so there we go. Let's start addressing the problems at their scale and not pretend like we're gonna address them not that way, so thank you. Becky, thank you. What I'd like to do to close is start again at the mouth of the Klamath and move upstream. Chairman James of the Yurok, what do you see in future and what do you see as needs in future, please? Yeah, thank you, Jim. I'll try to be brief, uh, but it, it's tough. It's hard when you're talking about the river. Um, you know, restoration efforts. You know what? These dams are down in my mind already. Um, nothing falls short of them being down is the restoration effort. Uh, a Klamath Basin restoration bill. Um, Becky mentioned a billion. Absolutely. We don't get out of bed without for one billion. That's what's owed at a minimum to the restoration of the Klamath Basin. That's the work that's coming next, and that's going to be a, a long haul, and we all can do it, and we're all going to play a part in it. Uh, uh, the practices that all of us utilized in the past, everybody's got to be creative in ways to, 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 to be all in uh, for the health of, of the basin. Um, and so for me, uh, Matt, fast forwarding is a, is a, is a restoration bill that's to improve the, the Klamath Basin. And there's going to be multi-billions. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad we're saying the B with the indigenous people. So that's that's just for starters, from my from my perspective. And like you said, I uh, uh, I thank you, Jim. Uh, but I can go longer. But uh, I, I know we're closing up. But I but I enjoy the conversation. Chairman James, thank you so much. Chairman Atterbury of the Karuk. What do you see in future? What do you wish in future? 
So um, for uh, me, the, the future is uh, we're doing this for, for the next generations. Um, as tribal leaders, we, we listen to our tribal membership. We, our councils listen to tribal membership and we bring those thoughts back. And um, we have, uh, in the future, I look forward to um, uh, my happiest day as chairman. Um, as uh, Chairman Gentry said, I'm also on my third term as the group chairman and my saddest day approximately three or four years ago is when I had to tell our tribal elders there will be no fish this year. There will be limited fish for your dinner table and there will be no, no fish for our ceremonies. So I look forward to uh, the happiest day as chairman when I can say that the fish are abundant again and uh, I would like to offer a thanks to uh, Mark Branson and, and all of his crew uh, because tribal members have asked what are, have we thought out and, and looked at the best practices? And we have, and we, we were able to assure them that these practices, these best practices work and we look forward to um, Again, I look forward to my happiest day as chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Atterbury. Finally, Chairman Gentry of the Klamath Tribes. Yeah, I'll, um, I see there's a lot of work to be done and it's, it's so complex because there are so many folks with different standing and different responsibilities. I really believe that uh, uh, we're in this situation because um, of what uh, the federal government allowed to happen and what the state is allowed to happen. And uh, a lot of people are suffering. You know, it's uh, evident that uh, the whole watershed is, is hurting. You know, we're facing endangered fish that are about ready to blink out that I used to be able to catch when I was younger and we haven't been able to catch since 1986. The salmon we haven't been able to harvest since they put the first dam in, the Copco one, in on the river without fish ladders they'll promise to our people. But the, the, the problems are complex and I think if, if we can actually uh, come together with a unified understanding and even assess where the problems are, where the best places to focus our efforts and restoration, and uh, with the federal support and the state support with the funding necessary to do the restoration, we, we can get there. Um, I don't think it's possible to go back to what people refer to as pre-contact uh, 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 days, you know, but I believe that this land is resilient. There is an opportunity to do things better than what we have. But we're never going to get there unless we focus on the real problems and quit drawing lines in the sand. And uh, um, the position that we're, we're taking is uh, um, we, we want restoration. We want those resources back. They're important to us. And I, and I didn't really speak about how important the fish are to me personally, you know, as a person that's fished and caught uh, fish and still fish. My grandson brings me fish. You know, I just got a, a, a red band trout, one of the last fish that uh, we have opportunity to fish and uh, just brought that to me. And uh, so uh, I, I, we need to be looking at the real problem. We need to be, have a, a unified understanding and effort focused. And, uh, uh, and I believe we need to hold the federal, federal and state entities accountable for that. And, but we need to have a heart as a community to focus on the right thing. Because um, you know people that are responsible for their lands need to have a heart for that land and heart for their neighbors and realize that we're all in it together. If we can have that unified focus, I think we can get there. Chairman Gentry, thank you. All panelists, thank you. And at least I, and I'm sure many of those who are listening are feeling, may it be so. May your wishes to find a way to work together, to move forward together be so. Thank you again for the time you have given us, for sharing honestly in a heartfelt way and helping us appreciate the Klamath Basin, its past and future. We now invite all of you who are listening to please join our Lewis and Clark student moderators in a conversation via the Zoom link you received uh, 
I believe today via the one you have seen on the screen and may see on the screen here soon. Again, I deeply appreciate you, distinguished panelists, for coming today, for helping what I believe is a very large audience understand and appreciate your past, present, and future in the Klamath Basin. And let us all remember to honor our places, our people, our lives, and our livelihoods around us. Thank you, panelists. Walk well, Jim. Walk thank well. you. Yo, thank you. Thank you again and good night. Jim, are we supposed to join the other link? Thank you, everyone, again. Chairman Gentry and Atterbury, thank you for being here. I see Becky. Um, it is optional to join the other link. Uh,